Hello and welcome to the Davidson Institute's recorded webinar on purchasing business assets. My name is Rob Lucker and I'm going to be your presenter for the next 30 minutes or so. Now it's always great when you buy your first motor vehicle or piece of equipment for your business as it means you're really committed to making that business a success. As your business grows, you buy more equipment or replace equipment that wears out. Now while it always feels good to be buying new equipment, you probably also have some concerns about the amount of money you're outlaying in the hope you get enough business to utilise your equipment effectively. Yet we can reduce those concerns if we understand what drives our need for assets, how they'll support the business in generating income or creating efficiencies, and what the key considerations are when buying and funding your business assets. So the first thing we're going to have a look at today is what drives the need to purchase an asset and how the asset will support your business to generate greater profits. Then we'll have a look at the financial impacts of asset purchases on a business from both a profit and a cash flow perspective. And then finally we're going to examine the different ways assets can be funded and how to choose the best type of funding for your business. The decision to purchase business assets, you know, whether that's new equipment, technology or vehicles or whatever it might be, is never taken lightly. And I've seen it lead to many sleepless nights for business owners. However, if we can understand what drives the need for more assets and how the business will benefit, then the purchasing decision becomes easier and less stressful. One of the first things we really need to understand about our assets is that we need them to make sales. If you are new to business or are growing a business, the growth in sales will generally require a growth in assets. So let me show you a simple growth outcome model. At point A, we are making a certain level of sales. This level of sales gives us a certain amount of profit, but we also need a certain level of assets to support it. Now if we can maintain our profit margin and the efficiency with which we use our assets, we can grow sales from point A to point B, which means that while we are spending more money on assets, we are also making more profit. However, if we buy assets but find them underutilized or have a loss of efficiency, this could lead to moving from A to C, which will cost us more money for our assets, but with no gain in profit. Now, it would be great to be able to go from point A to point D, you know, more profit without an investment in assets. However, I'm going to say this generally only occurs when a previous inefficiency or underutilization is rectified in your business. So in deciding on the piece of equipment you may need to take you on the path from A to B, you must understand how it will meet the promise you make to your customers at the right cost. You'll need to take into account the quality, speed, reliability, cost, ease of use, and of course any other requirements that are important to sales and profitability. This of course means that selection of the right asset is critical. We're going to use a case study to demonstrate how we can determine our asset requirements and help ensure we invest in the right assets. So let me introduce you to Terry. Terry operates a warehouse. Now a few years back, Terry bought his first forklift. Now at the time he purchased it, he thought it was great. However, it quickly became evident that it probably wasn't the best choice. You see, it all sounded great when the salesman sold it to him, but it turned out to have more capacity than Terry needed. Its extended height was actually above the roof of the warehouse. It could carry capacities much greater than what Terry's customers generally need, and the petrol motor in the enclosed space of his warehouse made life uncomfortable for the people in, in his warehouse. And the cost? Well, let's say it was a fair bit more than Terry had intended to spend. The good news is, though, that Terry's business has been growing strongly and Terry now needs an additional forklift. Now, given his last experience and the fact there are dozens out there on the market, ranging from as little as $5,000 up into the hundreds of thousand dollars, he's decided to do, to do a bit of homework and work out what his requirements are first before looking around. To help him select the right forklift, Terry set out a checklist for himself. Now he started by working out how he was going to use the forklift. He broke his list up into the main productivity factors, you know, the things the forklift absolutely had to be able to do, and then he had a look at the secondary factors, you know, what would be nice to have and make life a little bit easier. The most important factor for Terry was how much was it going to be used. He calculated that on average there are 15 lifts per day, but sometimes it gets as high as 40 lifts. He worked out the averages and maximums so he can look at the different options of forklifts out there. The one he ends up picking will need to at least cover the average and maybe cover the maximum. 
You know, if the maximum only happens occasionally, it could have potentially be covered by a temporary hire rather than buying too much capacity. The second thing he looked at was what loads needed to be lifted. Having a look at his current customers and the new ones coming on board, they have an average load of about 1.8 tonnes, frequently getting to 2 tonnes and very occasionally getting up to 3.5 tonnes. The third main one that he looked at was his height he required. The effective ceiling for the warehouse is 10 metres. The higher shelf though is only 8 metres and Terry is not looking to extend that shelving any higher. These are the non-negotiable aspects because without these, his forklift would not be able to do the job he needs it to do. Now the next thing he considered was the secondary factors. These are all the other features of the asset which may help sway his final decision one way or the other. Now these are the things like, you know, the type of load to be lifted. The terrain where it will be operated. You know, there are off-road versions, but Terry, of course, has a flat warehouse floor or delivery area and doesn't need the additional clearance and traction. What distance would be travelled? Ease of use, you know, which could improve productivity of staff. Size and turning circle are also important for manoeuvrability in the aisles. And, of course, are there any environmental factors to be considered? The final options column in the table is for Terry to record the different makes and models that he is considering. This comparison will give Terry a chance to make a better choice. Not necessarily the cheapest or the one the salesperson thinks best, but the one that will best support Terry's business. Okay, so this list works well for Terry. However, when considering your own equipment, the specifications, of course, are going to be different. You know, if you're getting a lathe, the quality, tolerances or number of pieces a day may be the main productivity factors. Or maybe if you were buying a van, they may be the weight of the load, the usable load space and the expected mileage. Taking that time to think about what are the important aspects of the equipment for your business will help you make a more confident decision on your equipment purchase. Now before Terry makes that final decision to get the forklift, he'll also need to look at the financial impact on his business. You know, will it be profitable and how does it affect the cash flow of the business? Think about all the costs involved in purchasing an asset in your business. Now, let's have a look at Terry as an example, but keep your own business in mind as you may have many similar costs. Terry is looking at buying a forklift that costs $30,000. Now, have a look at all the different costs to purchase and run the equipment. After all, it's not just about the initial purchase price. Each year, the value of the piece of equipment is going to reduce due to wear and tear. This is generally accounted for by depreciation. Then, of course, it's going to need to be insured and maintained. You know, it will be need to be secured and operators may need training. And if we're borrowed to purchase the equipment, there's going to be borrowing costs as well. And, of course, these are just the costs to own or have the equipment. You know, whether we use the equipment or not to make sales, we will still incur these costs. These are referred to as fixed costs. Then, of course, if we do use the equipment, there are other costs as well. You know, perhaps fuel, electricity, you know, what we call consumables. And these will increase the more we use the equipment. These are known as variable costs. Understanding the cost to purchase, own and use the equipment is going to help you to calculate the financial impact on your business. As I said, depreciation is the way we account for the value that is going away from our assets. So it's important to understand how depreciation is calculated as it's going to affect your profitability, your tax position and will ultimately be an important factor in deciding how to fund the asset. So the two figures we need to calculate depreciation are the cost and the effective life of the equipment. If we have a look at Terry's forklift, the forklift costs $30,000 and it has an effective life of about 10 years. Now there are two different methods of calculating depreciation, prime cost and diminishing value. The prime cost method provides us with an equal amount every year over the life of the asset and is calculated simply by dividing the cost of the asset by the number of years it's in, of its anticipated useful life. So in Terry's case, the calculation is $30,000 divided by 10 years, or if you like, $3,000 per year. The other method is diminishing value, which uses a percentage of the written down value each year. So if we use 15% in Terry's example, in the first year, the forklift would be depreciated by 15% of its $30,000 value, being $4,500. In the second year, it would be depreciated by the same percentage on the depreciated value of $25,500, and so on until it's fully written off. 
This means you're actually able to depreciate more in the first year and less each year as the value and possible usefulness of your equipment decreases. Now, there's lots of accounting rules about how assets are depreciated, so I always advise to get your accountant to help you choose the best method for your business. But whichever method is best for your business, it may have an impact on how you finance the asset, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later in this recorded webinar. But first, let's have a look at the other costs for Terry's forklift. Now, the forklift, I said, costs $30,000 new to buy. This means it'll have GST of $3,000. Terry does not expect any installation costs, but the forklift expect to have an effective life of 10 years, and we just calculated depreciation at $3,000 per year using the prime cost method. Any staff using the forklift will need to be trained in operations and safety, which Terry has estimated at about $1,800. Of course, there'll be scheduled maintenance, including parts, about $2,000 per year. And to protect Terry's investment, he's going to spend about $200 on security and another $2,000 on insurance each year. Now, we're going to assume Terry will buy the forklift outright at present, so there's going to be no borrowing costs. Now, if we add all these together, we can see that Terry would have approximately $9,000 in fixed costs each year. Now, that's just to own the forklift. Then, of course, each time he uses it, it's expected that the forklift will use approximately $1 in its consumables, you know, things like fuel and oil, you know, per lift. This, then, is his variable cost. Once we have all our costs worked out, we can start calculating how much will our piece of equipment, you know, in this case, Terry's forklift, cost us in delivering our product or service. You know, that is, each time we make a sale and use the forklift, how much will it actually cost? This is important because we can then use that to help price our product to cover our costs. Now, the cost per unit will generally depend on how much we utilise the equipment. You know, the more utilisation, the lower the cost. Now, we've shown on the screen the total fixed cost and variable cost per unit or lift from our previous calculations. To work out the total cost per unit or lift, it is the fixed costs divided by the number of units plus the variable cost per unit or lift. Now, we know that the maximum number of lifts Terry may do are about 40 per day, and he's open 300 days during the year, which gives us a maximum capacity of 12,000 lifts. If we take the $9,000 fixed cost and divide it by 12,000 lifts, we find at maximum capacity, Terry's fixed cost per unit are 75 cents. Add that to the variable cost of $1, and our total cost per unit or lift is $1.75. However, if we're only to use it at 50% capacity, that is 6,000 lifts a year or 20 a day, our cost per unit would rise to $2.50 per lift. Now, the graph we're looking at now shows us how much the cost per unit varies for each level of utilisation. At 2,000 lifts per year or 7 lifts a day, it is $5.50 all the way down to $1.75 at maximum capacity of 12,000 lifts. What you need to think about is how much of the capacity do you expect to use and take this into account when working out the price to the end customer. Now let's say you budget for 50% capacity and base the price on $2.50 per lift. If you don't get enough business, our per unit cost will increase and you will make less profit. If we do better than 50% capacity, our per unit cost will decrease and we'll be making more profit. It may also be the key in deciding to hire instead of to buy, particularly if the per unit hiring cost at low utilisation levels is less than the per unit cost to own. As always, be realistic with your assumptions and make sure you set your prices appropriately. So in terms of setting his price, Terry wants to make a return of 20% per year on his cost of $30,000, which means that he needs to make $6,000 each year. Now, we said earlier that Terry's anticipated usage was 6,000 lifts per year, which means that he needs to make $1 from each lift. We just calculated that his expected cost per lift was $2.50, so adding the $1 required profit, Terry needs to add $3.50 per lift to his pricing to obtain his return of 20% per round. Of course, Terry's confident that his customers will absorb a little more, so he settles on $3.65. At $3.65, he achieves a profit of $1.15 per lift, but with 6,000 lifts a year, this means his profit will be $6,900 on the forklift. And of course, he can add this to the rest of his bottom line. The other area to look at the financial impact is the impact on cash flow. Now, when you buy a piece of equipment, the first impact is, of course, the outgoing cost of the equipment. In Terry's case, this is $30,000. 
Oh, don't forget to add in setup costs and GST for the equipment. The 3000 GST for Terry is indicated by the little red bar at the bottom there. Now the good news is, depending on how you fund your asset, you could get the GST back on your next BAS statement. From the calculations on the previous slide, we saw that Terry is generating approximately $7,000 cash per year from using his forklift. So at the end of year one, he will have covered almost one quarter of the original cost represented by the line on the graph and received his GST back. If Terry can continue to generate approximately $7,000 cash every year for the 10 year life of the forklift, he will have fully covered the original cost of the forklift in just over four years. By the end of 10 years, he could have accumulated cash profits from the forklift of almost $40,000. If the utilization of the equipment changes, it will impact the payback period and the ultimate profit. If his utilization drops, the payback period lengthens and profit reduces. Alternatively, of course, if the usage increases, then the payback period reduces and his profit increases. Understanding how the cash flow works on a piece of equipment can help in deciding whether to proceed with the acquisition and, of course, the best way to fund it. Okay, so far we've looked at understanding the need for assets and selecting the asset that will be most effective in increasing efficiency. Then we looked at costs and the impact on our cash flow. Now we need to look at the different ways we can complete the acquisition from hiring it, using our own cash or borrowing. Now, when purchasing assets, you should keep the cardinal rule in mind, and that is to match the life of the loan with the life of the asset. Now, this is an old age, which I believe can help you with your funding decisions and help to take the stress out of your cash flow. Let me give you a little example to show you what I mean. A number of years ago, I had a customer with a highly seasonal business, which meant at times she had a lot of cash in her account and at others she was using her overdraft. But at the end of one of particularly good season, Sam had a lot of cash in her account and went out and bought her dream car. It was a little yellow convertible Beetle. Now, it's not my choice of car, but I'm going to say it definitely suited Sam. This, however, created a problem for Sam down the track. Sam had used the cash in her account, but when her next season started, she did not have enough cash to buy the stock she needed. Sam had broken the cardinal rule. She had used her short-term cash to buy a long-term asset. Now, fortunately, her bank was prepared to help her out by refinancing the car and freeing up the cash for her. But she went through a lot of stress and cost before we could fix this up. So what are the options to acquire the new assets the business needs? Well, one option is to hire instead of purchase. If you don't get the full capacity utilisation out of your equipment, then as we saw earlier, the per unit cost of hiring may actually be cheaper. Secondly, if you have the cash available, you may wish to use your own funds and pay cash, but make sure you don't fall into Sam's mistake there. Or you may wish to finance your purchase. The question of whether to hire or acquire often comes back to capacity or utilisation. Now, if there's only a small or intermittent need for the additional piece of equipment, then hiring may be a more cost-effective option than having underutilised equipment impacting on your profitability. So here's some key questions to think through when considering hiring. How much capacity is actually required? Now, we saw in the previous slide that at low usage rates, the cost per use increases. If your usage will be low or intermittent, is it cheaper to hire the piece of equipment? Secondly, it's imperative that the equipment will be available when you need it. Is the hire company likely to have the equipment available? Remember too, if your need's seasonal, how many other businesses are going to be looking to hire the same piece of equipment at the same time? Or maybe if you've got specialised equipment, is it actually available to hire? And the third consideration, is the hire equipment likely to be in a suitable condition to get your job done? When hiring, you have limited control over the quality of the equipment and its maintenance. The last thing you want is to have hired a piece of equipment that can't do the job you need. So check out your hire company beforehand. Now, if hiring isn't going to work for you, then you'll need to purchase the equipment. So then comes the decision, of course, do I use my own cash or do I borrow? Now, you may have the cash available, as Sam did, and want to use that to buy the asset outright. If this is the case, thinking back to Sam again, remember the cardinal rule to match the life of the loan to the life of the asset. If you do use your own cash, you will not be able to use it again until it slowly comes back in over the equipment's useful life. So consider carefully. You know, firstly, do you have the cash available? Is your cash required for your day-to-day -day operations? If not now, then potentially in the near future. 
And could you get a better return on your cash elsewhere? Now, this could be in the form of obtaining discounts from your suppliers for paying sooner or maybe buying in bulk, or even the return for investing the cash in a deposit or something similar. Always think, what is the most efficient use for the cash that you have available in your business? Remember our cash flow? Well, this is how Terry's cash flow would look if he paid cash and received approximately $7,000 per year back to cover the costs. He'd recoup the cost of the forklift in approximately four years. After four years, the cash contribution would add to his usual cash flow. Now, if borrowing to acquire their asset is your selection, there is still a decision to be made, as there are a number of borrowing options. Now, often people think of a business loan which requires security, such as cash or property. However, if the equipment you need is not overly specialised and it could be sold on a second-hand market, you may be able to take advantage of various equipment finance options which may only require the asset and director's guarantees of security. Now, there are four main types of equipment finance. Commercial loan, commercial hire purchase, finance lease or equipment rental. Each type of finance will have a different cost and impact cash and profits differently. But the first question on most people's minds, particularly if they're considering borrowing, is... What will the monthly repayments be? Well, to get an indication of how much the repayments may be, you could use a calculator like the one on Westpac's website. This particular one is for motor vehicles, and it's used at interest rate of 5.34% per annum. Other types of equipment may have a different interest rate, and of course, interest rates on this type of finance will vary regularly. So you should always talk to your banker and get a quote specific to the item you're looking at acquiring when you're ready for that. But for Terry's forklift, based on the above calculator, the loan amount is the cost of the forklift, i.e. $30,000. His term is going to be five years, and he wants to fully pay the loan off by the end. So the repayments will be approximately $579.23 a month, or just under $7,000 per year. If Terry finances his forklift under those conditions, his cash flow may now look like this. We've assumed that he pays his GST up front and then reclaims it straight away. Now, there's no need, of course, to pay out the $30,000 at the beginning because he's borrowed the money. But as we calculated earlier, he can generate the $7,000 cash each year to match the loan repayments of approximately $7,000. These repayments include interest and remain fixed for the term of the finance. Now, effectively, he will have paid approximately $5,000 in interest costs over that five years, which, of course, reduces his cash profit to just under $35,000 compared to the original $40,000. Each type of finance has different terms and conditions, so will of course impact your finances differently. So when selecting the right type of finance for your business, there are four main things you'll need to consider. Ownership of the asset, the impact on your cash flow, how the GST will be treated, and the effect on your income tax position. So let's take a look at each of those in a little more detail. Looking at the question of ownership, while the most important for you is probably the availability and use of the equipment in your business, there may be reasons why you may or may not want to own the asset, you know, either throughout the finance term or at the end of the finance term. Ownership considerations can impact you, your tax position and the type of finance you obtain. So let's have a look if you own the asset at the start or the end of the finance term. With a commercial loan, you are the owner of the asset. Both the asset and liability appear on your balance sheet. This means you are fully responsible for the asset, its insurance, running costs, maintenance, and final disposal. With higher purchase, on the other hand, the financier owns the asset until the agreement is paid in full and ownership will then transfer to you. Now, both the asset and the liability are going to appear on your balance sheet, and while you may not own the asset during the financing term, for tax purposes, the Australian Tax Office will consider you to be the owner. With a finance lease, again, the asset is owned by the financier during the term of the finance. However, at the end of the term, you can make an offer to purchase the asset and pay out the financier. If you choose not to take up ownership, the financier has the responsibility to dispose of the asset. Equipment rental, on the other hand, means that you rent the equipment and simply hand it back at the expiry of the agreement. You do not own it. Quite often, people use equipment rental for things like computers, which get outdated quickly and therefore are not worth keeping at the end of the contract. This gives them the option to update the latest technology. However, with equipment rental, 
you should read the conditions of your rental contract carefully and make sure you can meet their conditions, particularly at the end of your contract term. As we know, financing the entire purchase allows you to spread the cost of the equipment purchase over the term of the finance, which can be helpful for your cash flow. But there are other options that may suit your cash flow even better. If you have some cash available, you could pay a deposit up front, which will reduce your monthly payments and your interest bill. This is available with a commercial loan or higher purchase. Or you could pay a residual or balloon payment at the end of your finance term. Again, this will reduce your monthly payment, but increase your interest bill. It's available with commercial loan, higher purchase and finance lease. Now, although with a finance lease, the Australian Tax Office, you know, the ATO, will set the minimum residual amount. Neither of these options apply to equipment rental because you don't own the goods. Let's have a look at an example for Terry. Now, using Terry's forklift, we're still starting with our $30,000 over five years, but with a 43% or $12,900 residual to be paid at the end of the finance term. And now, a good rule of thumb is to make your residual what you expect the value of your equipment will be or what you would get for a trade-in at the end of that finance term. Now, remember, we're using a calculator for motor vehicles and the interest rate and residual values may actually be different for different types of equipment. But in this case, Terry's monthly payment has now dropped to $397.01 per month or $4,764 per year. Let's look at this graphically. His repayments are now only just over $400 per month or almost $5,000 per year. But with the same amount of usage and pricing, he would still continue to receive almost $7,000 per year in cash profit. As you can see from the line, Terry is now cash flow positive for all years except year five when he has to pay out the $12,900 residual. However, it's going to have cost him just over $7,000 in interest and his eventual profit will have decreased to just under $33,000 from the original $40,000. GST is another consideration when determining which type of finance best suits your business. Now it all boils down to when you pay the GST and even more importantly, when you claim it back. Now with a commercial loan, you may pay the GST up front and claim it back at your next business activity statement, you know, assuming you're using the asset 100% for taxable business activities. Some financiers will include the amount of GST in your finance amount and you repay it when you receive the cash back from the Australian Taxation Office. Now with higher purchase, the financier pays your GST up front and includes it in the amount borrowed. But as the Australian Tax Office deems you to be the beneficial owner of the asset, you can claim the GST on your next BAS statement. Similar to the commercial loan, you pay the GST back into the loan and reduce your interest. But your financier in this case may actually allow you to keep the GST and use it for your business. This means though that you're going to be paying the GST back over the term of finance and it will cost you a little more in interest in the long run. If you're using higher purchase, you will have to pay GST on your interest payments each month over the term of the finance. With finance leases and equipment rental, you will be paying GST on the rental amount. Now the final consideration when selecting the type of finance is how it will impact your income tax position. And this again stems back to the ownership question. Where the goods are owned by you for tax purposes, as they are under commercial loan and high purchase, you can claim depreciation and interest on the finance as a business expense. This is because under higher purchase, the Australian Tax Office, the ATO, deems you the hirer to have beneficial ownership. Now, when the goods are owned by the financier, as they are with a finance lease and equipment rental, then your monthly lease payment or rental is the business expense. So it's a good idea to discuss this with your accountant about which option is better for your own tax position. So all of these things, ownership, cash flow, GST and income tax, need to be considered when deciding on the best way to finance an asset purchase. Now, while it may sound a little complicated, the financial position of the business at the time of the purchase will probably make the choice quite straightforward. And you can always use a checklist to help you out. And that's exactly what Terry's done. So let's have a look at Terry's forklift purchase checklist and see what type of finance may suit him best. Now, firstly, in terms of ownership, Terry's opinion is that the forklift will have another few good years economic life left at the end of the finance term. 
Now, he does not care if he owns the asset from the start, but he would like to keep the forklift after it's paid off. Now, this means that he could finance either as a higher purchase, commercial loan, or finance lease. In terms of cash flow, Terry does not have the cash available to make a deposit up front. However, he would like to reduce his monthly payments by having a lump sum payable at the end of the finance term. Again, this is available on the higher purchase, commercial loan, or finance lease options. The option of paying a deposit up front, of course, is not available on that finance lease or equipment rental, as Terry will not have ownership of the goods with these options. In terms of GST, Terry likes the idea of claiming his GST in his first BAS statement, so higher purchase and commercial loan are more appealing from that perspective. He also likes the idea of financing the GST for the term of the loan, using it effectively as an extra amount of credit that does not require extra security. This is mainly offered on higher purchase and sometimes on commercial loans as well. Terry uses the diminishing balances method of depreciation, meaning he can claim more depreciation, reducing his tax in the early years of the forfeit. So for income tax purposes, Terry's preference is to claim the interest and depreciation as opposed to a monthly lease payment or rental. So it would appear that in Terry's situation, a higher purchase is likely to be the most suitable for him due to being able to finance his GST, although this is going to cost him a little more in interest in the long run. Today's webinar has been all about purchasing business assets in a way that supports the business to achieve its goals. The need for more assets is generally driven by growth or improving efficiency. Any acquisition of assets is going to have a financial impact, positive and negative, on a business, and we have looked briefly at how we can calculate that impact. Then finally, we discussed the different options for funding the purchase and again approached it from the perspective of what is the best way to achieve the business goals. Now, if you're interested in equipment finance, please contact your banker directly or visit Westpac's website at www.westpac.com.au. Thank you for your time today. I trust that you found this information useful and relevant, and I thoroughly recommend you checking out the other webinars and guides on Davidson Institute's website for more information to build your financial confidence. So thanks again for joining us today.